Hi, this is Matthew Baldwin of Mars Hill University, and this is the Ideas of Jesus video podcast, episode 10. I can't believe I'm already up to 10. I'm joined here today with Dr. Mira Kensky. Let me switch the view so that you can see. Mira Kensky. I'm so glad you could be here with me today, Mira. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Let me tell uh, the viewership a little bit about you. Dr. Mira Kensky is the Joseph E. McCabe Associate Professor of Religion at Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where she also serves as the Director of Advising. And you have all of our sympathy for that. <laughs> I love advising. Advising is good. It's good work. She holds a PhD in New Testament from the University of Chicago Divinity School, where she worked with Hans Josef Klauck and others, developing her expertise in New Testament, early Christian literature, and the cultural world of Second Temple Judaism and Rabbinic Judaism. She is the author of Trying Man, Trying God, The Divine Courtroom in Early Jewish and Christian Literature. That's more Seebeck, 2012. And I suspect we'll be hearing more about this work today as we talk 2010. about- 2010. Oh, 2010? 2010. Okay. That's all right. It's oh, even longer cool. since I wrote it, even <laughs> so far in the past. <laughs> I suspect we'll be hearing more about this work today as we talk about Jesus on trial in the Gospel of John. Uh, Mira has presented and published extensively on the narrative literature of early Christianity, offering interesting work on tales of travel and pilgrimage, courtroom literature, and much more. She is known and widely recognized as an outstanding teacher and researcher in the field of early Christian studies. Recently, Dr. Kensky has been working on Christian apocryphal texts dealing with the otherworldly travels of the Apostle Peter and Paul, and on Timothy, who was known among early Christians as Paul's travel companion and apparent successor. She is working on two book projects that are currently under development, one on the figure of Timothy in Pauline and post-Pauline literature, forthcoming in Bund, and the intriguingly titled Go to Hell, Vicarious Travel with Peter and Paul in Early Christian Literature, forthcoming from Erdman's Press. Welcome, Mira. I'm so glad we could sit down together for this conversation. Thanks for agreeing to do Thank this. Thank you so much for having me. I know you've lately been working on other matters and could easily talk for hours about the figure of Timothy or what early Christians thought Peter and Paul saw on their trips into the next world. But this video podcast is focused on ideas of Jesus, so I hope you don't mind talking about the big J. Okay. Okay, I know you can do it. I know that you, like me, uh, you do it all, teaching on all manner of topics in New Testament and early Christianity. And I also know that your earlier trajectory of research, the research that led to your dissertation and to Trying Man, Trying God, touched directly on the literary forces that shaped the canonical gospels, among other things. And in particular, the ways that the Gospels portrayed Jesus on trial before the authorities prior to his crucifixion. It's that perspective that I'd like to explore today, if you're willing. Sure. I mean, most of my research was not on Jesus on trial, per se, but on the way that courtroom imagery and imagery of the divine courtroom manifests itself in texts like the Gospels, the letters of Paul, early Christian texts like Revelation, and the apocryphal literature. Um, but I definitely spent some significant time talking about um, what does it mean to have an image where you have, have these extended scenes where you have Jesus on trial before in a kind of kangaroo court, before the Jewish authorities and the as the Gospels portray it, and then in a kind of... Um, a speedy, speedy uh, scenario before Roman authorities. Right. Um, the gospel portrayal. Well, one of the things that interests me about this approach that you took is that, of course, it implies, you know, that if there's this presence of imagery that's familiar from other literature, that's these tropes that the authors are drawing on a literary world when they're imagining the trial scenes. And I think a lot of people are going to assume that uh, a story of Jesus on trial is just so, like a courtroom transcript, mm -hmm. like the type we have, you know, in our modern bureaucratic society. But these narratives came about in a different way. Could you say a little something about that? Well, it's kind of curious. You know, Mark is the first gospel really sets the parameters for what comes next. And he has this very... Um, fast paced, moving, just kind of episodic, like, and then this happened here, and then this happened here, and then this happened here, and now it's over. So it really takes place in a very, very short period of time. And there's very little dialogue. They, Mark uses some characterization, like they're doing this, 
-hmm. and then you know there's very little dialogue at all um but it's based because mark's not that interested first per se in what happens at the trial he is interested in his primary goal in the course of the whole gospel in the question of of you know the question of the identity of jesus and how people respond to jesus or who how they respond to what Jesus says and who they think Jesus is and, and kind of revealing that, you know, to the reader of who Jesus really is very early so that they can kind of use that perspective to read the whole gospel. So that's not surprising that his gospel narratives that focus on the trial are also about the identity of Jesus. Who are you? Who are right. you? And less about the question of guilt or innocence and, and things like that, or really less interested in you know giving a transcript and more interested in in portraying people as you know kind of incapable of understanding who jesus is or what role they're playing in these hastily moving events and that really that pattern really holds for the other synoptic gospels um matthew who expands this somewhat um in his presentation of the trial scenes he paints the leaders as more nefarious than mark even in what they are doing um and really plays plays up the culminant the culpability of the Jewish leaders and plays down the culpability of Pilate, adding that famous scene in which Pilate literally like washes his hands of the blood of Jesus and the people are like, we'll, we'll take the blood guilt, which is a text that's had uh, enormous violent repercussions in the history of anti-Jewish um, rhetoric and action. Um, and then Luke, who's a little more interested in kind of, well, what would the political maneuverings really be like, has that other trial. Um, before Herod, which is not in either Matthew or Mark, and which some people think is actually added into the trial scenes of Jesus in order to um, parallel what happens to Jesus with what happens to Paul in Acts, rather than vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. So the, in terms of like what happens, we, we never get a, um, you know, a transcript per se, or an, I would say a, even an attempt to like represent faithfully everything that was happened at these at these trials um and in that way they're kind of different from the novelistic literature that's happening at the time where the courtroom scenes are these like elaborate often elaborate vehicles for revelation that the narratives have been kind of you know propelling us towards for the whole time um it's not they're not really playing that role even though they come you know towards the end just like the courtroom scenes come towards the end of the greek novels they become less kind of moments of like narrative revelation and more kind of just like just stuff people are doing on the way to calvary gotcha but i think that's an important point that most people uh, probably would escape their notice that i'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about that in other uh, ancient novelistic literature, which we know from the same time period, courtroom scenes also play a role, and they also play that sort of final culminating role. Mm -hmm. Can you give uh, like one example or two examples of that? No, because I'm going to screw it up because I haven't read okay, these yeah, well, in a long time. We'll, no, we'll go back to that. <laughs> Fine, you're totally entitled to say no. I'd rather have you be cautious. And um, not go out on a limb. You know, the Greek novels, they, I know that, I, I feel bad saying this because I know that people spend their whole life studying them and this is what they do. And, and they're really, you know, very, I plotted through a bunch of them this summer over again in order to um, talk about travel. For something I was doing was related to travel. I was talking about travel in Greek novels and the way the reader kind of moves through the text with the characters and how that happens differently. Um, and I was reminded that the Greek novels are, you know, difficult to read. They're very, very dense and they plot along, but at the same time, like 1,000 things happen every page. Um, and so I, they kind of all run together in my head, even though that's a terrible way of thinking about the Greek novels at all. Um, but they kind of run, they kind of run together a little bit in my head. So I, I'm not prepared. I have, br I have a COVID brain mush from being stuck inside for so uh, long. I'm not prepared to talk about the Greek novels. I think we all, we all are experiencing some of that for sure. Um, well, what are some uh, basic, you've already go covered the basic ideas of what readers should keep in mind about the gospel portrayals of Jesus on trial. It sounds like you're saying Mark provides the framework Matthew amplifies the evil of the Jewish leaders. Luke adds this odd trial before Herod, uh, which you know Pilate finds out Jesus is a Galilean, and so sends him to Herod Antipas, who happens to be in town 
at the time for the Passover, one presumes. It's a very unrealistic scene. It's unrealistic. That's what I was going to ask you. That It seems like the scholarly consensus is that just wouldn't have happened. Well, it just seems like Pilate doesn't need Herod's approval for anything. Right. Right. The, the, the way that the Gospels portray Pilate, especially Matthew and Luke, is kind of bending to the will or being afraid of the Jewish people, their constituency, is very unlike what we hear about Pilate from like Josephus um, and the way that Pilate doesn't hesitate to wield brute force, right, mm -hmm. to without trial right <laughs> in any yeah. sort of way it just seems very unrealistic that a roman governor would sort of cede authority if there was a sort of big 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 crisis guy that was causing trouble why would a roman governor cede authority to a client king on this it just doesn't seem realistic at all um and so that and the fact that 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 is a clearly on, coming only from luke and luke's special source right mm -hmm. and it doesn't have any parallel um in in matthew or mark or John, for that matter, which is to operating in a totally different way. Um, it just seems like it's more, less likely to be historically accurate. Le it, there's less verisimilitude there for me in terms of thinking about the machinations of Roman and Judean power, you know, and Pilate. But what do I know? Well, it also, it's, it's, it's ultimately, uh, it takes place over the course of about six or seven verses in Luke chapter 23, and there's actually nothing to it. It's, mm -hmm. it's again, That's a context where Jesus does not answer the questions that are put to him. It and just seems like Luke's trying to parallel what happens with Paul before Felix Agrippa. And I think that's what's really going on is that Luke possibly has that second volume in mind already. Mm -hmm. uh, as he's writing and is trying to, you know, kind of parallel these two figures. Um, that way, even though he tells the story in Acts, of, I know this is not an Images of Paul podcast, but he tells the story in Acts that ends with Paul preaching unhindered in Rome, which any reader would know, well, that's not what happened to Paul, right? Um, he died under <laughs> Roman authority. Um, and so perhaps this is a way for Luke to you know, use the story of Jesus to tell the story of Paul, um, you know, in that Jesus, you know, was cru crucified under Roman authorities, but he resurrected um, in Rome. You know, Paul was crucified under Roman authorities, but is dead, but that could still be a kind of a triumphant story in some ways if you're paralleling Jesus to it. Um, I don't know if that made any sense. It did. So turning to the Gospel of John, Oh. Let's talk about John. Yeah, what is distinctive about the trial of Jesus in the fourth gospel? So in order to really understand what's distinctive about the trial, I think it's really important to understand what's distinctive about John's thinking about courtrooms in general. Um, may, I, may, I, may I share my screen? I think you can. I, um, I'll just show you some stuff. Sure you can. Okay, hold on. I'm going to have to... Don't look, don't look, because I have to make the slideshow happen. Otherwise, you'll miss my uh, my beautiful uh, animations. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the divine courtroom in the Gospel of John for just like a minute. So um, as you all know from what, what Matt has said is that my research at one time centered around um, images of God holding trial. And we're used to thinking about that the way that early Christian literature talks about that, or early Christian authors talk about that, as something that's going to happen in the future, right? So here's an example from Matthew, right? By the way, this is the NRSV translation. Um, so this is right out of your HarperCollins study Bible, if that's what you use, okay? Right. So this is an example from Matthew 12, right? Where Matthew, Jesus is speaking in Matthew, and he says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned, right? So justified meaning acquitted here. So right. this is a classic image of the divine courtroom, right? It's something that's gonna happen in the future where every person's gonna give an account or have to reckon, right? That's why the day of judgment is sometimes called day of reckoning, have to reckon for what they've done here, what they've said is what's at issue here. Um, and that will either lead them to a positive verdict of, you know, not guilty, and thus presumably, uh, you know, eschatological salvation or a good eternal life, perhaps, depending on who's talking, um, or condemnation, 
right, or condemnation. So throughout the Gospel of Matthew, this is the way that you see the divine courtroom being talked about, right? And this is really common. You can think about Revelation and the idea of that there'll be a trial and the books are going to be opened at the very end of days. Um, this is very, very common as something that's going to happen in the future. Even Paul, that we know we normally talk about, Paul talking about justification by faith and not from works, he has in Romans 2 this idea of judgment according to deeds, right? That in some way we're all going to have to give an account for what we did. Mm -hmm. So this is really a very common way of talking about the divine courtroom, but John does something really, really different, which is that he really has this realized that the courtroom is somehow, the way that Jesus speaks in John, about the divine courtroom, it's something that is happening now, right? So here's an example from John 3. Oops, I'm trying to move my little box. Okay, so this comes right after everybody's favorite verse in John, the football verse, right? Um, For God so loved the world that he sent his uh, only son, etc. So here's John 3, 17. For God did not send his son in order to condemn the world, but rather in order that the world might be saved through him. And here's the key verse, right? The one who believes in him will not be condemned, but the one who does not believe has been condemned already. For he has not believed in the name of the only born son of God. For this is the crisis, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. That's a recall from the prologue about the light coming into the world. And right. men have loved darkness rather than light, for their works were wicked. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come towards the light in order that his works might not be proven guilty, but everyone who does good comes towards the light in order that it might be revealed that his works were worked in God. So here's an example of Jesus, of how the John uses divine, the courtroom language in a different way. Yeah. Right? So here you can really see There's that no for- future courtroom that he's pointing towards. It's not a future courtroom. It's like, it's happening right now, right? The light has come into the world, and now that's the crisis. That's the judgment point. How mm -hmm. people respond to the, you know, the judge or the light is going to it is determinative, right, of their future status. And not only is it future status, it's already status. You just aren't seeing it yet. You have been, right, have been condemned already. That's the perfect tense mm -hmm. in verse 18, right? The Idea. So you have in verse 18, right, this idea of the perfect tense, right, the one who does not believe has been condemned already, right, the future tense, like it already happened, you may not be able to visibly see it yet, right, but it's, it's sealed, right, it happened already, yeah. and this is, you know, this idea that, you know, the word crisis, right, is obviously where we get our word crisis, right, like it's a moment of judgment, right, this is it. And so this is the way that John uses this type of language throughout John, right, in the whole gospel. This is the way that Jesus right. speaks in the gospel of John. So if you look like it's something like John 5, right, which is, an, okay, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Don't worry, Matt. Okay. <laughs> right. The readers are, the listeners are invited to read this. Yeah, this is the All beginning of a, of a very long passage in John 5, where Jesus uses courtroom language in many different ways. Right? So the context of this is that Jews are castigating Jesus for healing someone on the Sabbath. Right? And then Jesus, rather than being on the defensive, like responding to these accusations, claims for himself this just judicial role. Like you think that I'm the defendant, right? But I'm actually the judge, right? And you can really see that mm -hmm. in verse 22, right? For the father does not judge anyone, but he's given all judgment to the son. Right. And he says, like in verse um, right, 27 and following, he gave him you know, authority to execute judgment. He's the son of man. Don't be amazed. Right. He says, I am not able to do anything by myself. I judge just as I hear. And my judgment is just Zikaya, for I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. So we have a situation where right, the Jews are accusing Jesus. And instead of being on the defense, he's basically saying, no, no, you've got this all wrong. Like, I'm not the defendant. <laughs> I'm the judge. I'm the one with authority to judge. But the weird thing about, like, John 5 is that that's not the only role, right, that Jesus claims or kind of plays in this kind of scene. Because, like, in what comes next, Jesus seems to recognize, oh, no, no, I, you know, I am sort of on trial in some way because I need testimony. Like, I need a witness, right? 
And he's like, and then he claims like several witnesses. I got John the Baptist as a witness. I got my deeds that I'm doing in verse 36 that I'm, a, that's the witness. And then he says, and God is my witness, right? That's what's going on in verse 37, mm. right? The father who sent me. So he does seem to suggest, okay, well, I do need a de to play defendant a little bit. And then it turns again. And in the later part, like just a few verses le later, he's saying to the Jews, like, don't think that I'm going to be the one who accuses you before the father. Like as if when we go up to trial, you're on trial and I'm going to be your prosecutor. He's like, no, no, Moses is, the pro is your prosecutor, right? Mm -hmm. You think Moses is going to be your intercessor, right? Like he, you know, the, and, and, and play savior for you, but no, 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 he's accusing you right now uh, because he wrote about me. So it's this weird John 5, Jesus like uses the courtroom language in John 5 to claim all these, to kind of constantly switch the courtroom. Mm. Um, Who's on trial? I mean, I think fundamentally um, in this scene, right, there's a sense that Jesus in some way is on trial before the readers of the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Because they're the ones who are seeing what's going on and have to make the decision, right? If you think about the very end of the gospel, well, the first end of the gospel, John 20, at the very end of John 20, when the evangelist says, you know, there are, Jesus did a lot of other signs too, but these are written so that you may come to believe, right? right? You know, this is what's happening in John is that Jesus is claiming these witnesses, right, um, in John 5, uh, in his favor before the reader, not before yeah. really the Jews, right? This is all being played out before the reader. And the, the important thing too is the turn, the tables get turned on those who accuse him. Yes. Oh, right. right. Exactly. Let's because that, it's not only Jesus is on trial, right? But the idea is that his accusers are also on trial. Yeah. And I really, really, this comes into play in the trial scenes. All right. So the trial scenes in the Gospel of John are much more elaborate, right? Much more elaborate than those in the rest of the Gospel, uh, the Gospels, the rest of the Synoptic Gospels. Um, and uh, Rudolf Schnackenberg and Raymond Brown really laid out the architecture of this, uh, of these scenes. Um, and really showed how the Gospel of John has created this, um, you know, ex highly literary uh, and carefully structured uh, selection of scenes that become, that highlight the contrast between what's going on between Pilate and Jesus on the one hand, and between Pilate and the crowds on the other hand, right? So the scenes start, right, with Jesus being led into the Praetorium with the Jews outside the Praetorium. This is John 18, right? But then what we get is a series of seven scenes which take place um, one after another, uh, alternatingly inside between Pilate and, Judy, Ju and, excuse me, and Jesus, and outside between Pilate and the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. So the first one is outside with Pilate and the Jews. Like, what case do you have against him? What's going on, right? And then we go in, then Pilate goes inside to have this kind of like fraught conversation with Jesus, right? Um, and I think I don't have, I did not open my Bible to the Gospel of John, which is stupid, but I'm doing it right now. La, 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 la. But I'm pretty sure this is um, a great example of the kind of Johannine way of discourse, right? The Johannine discourse in which what you have is, um, you know, someone asking Jesus something or someone uh, saying something and Jesus responding on a metaphorical or a symbolic way. And then the person misinterpreting that to me very literal and then Jesus, expo you know, kind of giving the exposition. And this is a pattern of discourse that you see throughout the Gospel of John. So you can, even like in that opening scene with Nicodemus, right, in John 3, John co Jesus comes to Nicodemus and tells him that everyone needs to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, how could I be born again? If he, how could I crawl back up into the womb, basically? And John's like, she's like, no, no, this is different, right? So here we have this situation where Pilate asks Jesus, like, are you the king of the Jews, right? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate's like, oh, you are a king, right? Because he doesn't get what Jesus is saying. And Jesus says, 
you know, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate famously says, what is truth? Yeah. And of course, you know, in the Gospel of John, like the readers got the answer to that, right? Because Jesus has already said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Yeah. I am the truth. So we have this like fraught scene between Pilate and Jesus, which is kind of, you know, representing in some way this inability of the humans who are at play in this kind of like dra cosmic drama to understand what's going on, where the reader has insider knowledge, right? And then we go right back outside, right? For the sort of famous like release Barabbas scene between Pilate and the Jews. And I don't need to tell you that the next scene is inside and then it goes outside, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of ecce homo, right, scene where Pilate's oh, presenting man. Jesus to hold the man. And what you really have in these sort of, you know, kind of alternating scenes is this contrast between these kind of serious, solemn, conversations between Pilate and Jesus and the kind of outside savage like mob pre the way they're presented in the Gospel of John so that when Pilate says you know behold the man which in Latin is famously like ecce homo right they're not able to like confront him as a man right because they've like descended in the way that they, you know John portrays it into um you know part of a demonic force um, following what John says about, you know, earlier in the gospel about the Jews being the spawn of Satan in chapter 11, chapter eight, chapter right? eight, yeah. chapter eight, John eight. Um, and then you get the real, the sign, you know, the really like tense discussion between Pilate and Jesus um, in, uh, you know, in 19, eight through 12, when Jesus tells Pilate, like, you would have no power over me. If it had, unless it had been given to you from above, right? Which Jesus is kind of trying to show Pilate, like, you think you're passing judgment, right? But this is not, what you think is going on is not what is going on. What you think is going on is not what is going on. And then, you know, finally this culminates, right, with the condemnation of Jesus by Pilate to the accompaniment of the Jews shouting. And this is really something that is really kind of funky about the gospel is the way how the narrative sets up what's happening leads us to realize the that it's something that has long looked like a, just a grammatical oddity is actually a carefully chosen uh, composition. And I'm going to show that to you right now. And then I'm going to turn this off. Not this shared screen off. Don't worry. Okay. So here it is. John 19, 13. After hearing these words, this is my translation now, Pilate brought Jesus outside in a copy sen on the judgment seat, on the Bema, at the place which is called Lithostratos, which is Gabata in Hebrew. Okay, mm -hmm. so this verb, ekathisan, right, can be translated two ways. He right? sat. Sat. What's the other one? Uh, you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> the other one is seated him, right? So it can be oh, transitive or intransitive, right? Ekathisan can take either mean like pilot sat, or it can mean he sat him, right? Like he akathi sent him, he seated Jesus, right? So what we have here is a situation where it's not clear who is sitting on the judgment seat, right? Is Pilate sitting on the judgment seat or has Pilate seated Jesus on the judgment seat? And you know, what's really weird and stupid about the commentary literature is that they seem to like want to make a decision one way or the other. Oh, no, 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 the gospel author intends to say that Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat. Or no, 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 the gospel author tends, intends to like, you know, have Pilate seating Jesus on the judgment seat ironically. It's like, no, no, no. The gospel author has taken advantage of this double meaning of this word to show us how Pilate thinks he is the one sitting on the judgment seat. But in actuality, it is Jesus who is sitting on the gospel seat because the trial of Jesus in the gospel of John is really a trial of the world who failed, mm -hmm. right? And so this is, this, this is a great ambiguous moment where really what you have is the, um, those who are in, the insiders will understand you know, who's the judge? Oh, it's Jesus or God to get Jesus acting together, right? Mm. But 
here, what, what it looks like to outsiders is Pilate exercising judicial authority. And so I just love the courtroom scenes in the Gospel of John because they really culminate in this, you know, grammatically um, well-chosen, right? Yeah. Well-chosen a, a moment. Anyway, so that's what's different about the Gospel of John. I'm going to stop sharing now. It's really the way that the Gospel of John uses the, this trial scenes to indict the world or condemn the world, really, or show how the world was condemned, right? So all of that is strongly suggested, you know, that the author of the uh, fourth gospel has deeply shaped whatever traditional materials have arrived. Jesus had a trial before Pilate, maybe is all he had. Uh, and the, the, the entire intent is theological. So obviously none of this can be regarded with any security as having any oh, history, right? I think this is the least very, very similar Right, the least likely to be historically plausible of all of the courtroom scenes. I mean, you, I mean, in what world does Pilate run back and forth? Does a Roman governor run back and forth? Right? Take, take counsel with the crowds outside. Right, you know, or shuttle. No, no, it's so unrealistic to me. And the architecture of seven, which is such a symbolic number in the Gospel of John, you know, Jesus performed seven signs. There are seven I am sayings. The architecture of the seven scenes, like it's just very carefully plotted. It is a literary masterpiece, but it is not likely to be historically accurate. Uh, now, I this is all, sort of takes us far afield because I'm not, I'm always less interested in in questions of history than I am in questions of literary portrayal or ideas about Jesus. But I I, I feel like I have to ask because what, right at the center of that uh, sevenfold back and forth is the release of Barabbas. Is that yeah. This. And I'm wondering what your take on that is. It's present from Mark through John. Mm -hmm. Does it have any historical resonance at all? Is it possible? Is it? Oh yeah, super possible? possible. Super possible. The idea that, that uh, you know that the idea that a Roman governor would use a festival day to show clemency in a highly symbolic public act seems very likely to me, um, especially an act a holiday that they are um, somewhat afraid of or is a time of some insecurity for them, which is Passover, because there's so many people flocking to the temple. And there were, according to Josephus anyway, so many different like, you know, um, minor revolts or disturbances around Passover because when people come together and they're people who are aggrieved at the economic and social situations, um, when they come together is a time where there can be protests, right, and disturbances and things like that, right? It's not an accident that the Roman, that, you know, when the Rome, when Herod um, redid the temple, the Fortress Antonio was abutting the temple, right? Like the, the Roman, um, military wanted to keep an eye on what was going on right at the temple which was the largest public space in Jerusalem. So I think it's totally possible right that at a moment like that um, you know beneficent leaders wanted to show their benevolence and their magnanimity 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 I don't remember what the word is right <laughs> yeah um, by you know uh, symbolically releasing a prisoner or doing something like that like just the way that people, bar abbas which is i know now, the name the, seems very um son of the father, but, son but of son the father. Of the, okay but bar abbas as a name right bar abbas son of the father could just be the equivalent of like john doe right because bar abbas like everybody's a bar okay. abbas everyone's a bar abbas right like it doesn't have i don't have any evidence that that's true like it doesn't have to be such a theologically like weighted name. Now it's possible that it was chosen just to be theologically weighted, especially in what Matthew does, right? Because Mark calls him Barabbas, but Matthew makes it even one step further and says Jesus Barabbas, right? Like Matthew right. gives Barabbas the first name of Jesus. So even more like heightening the like, oh, which one do you want? Like, do you want this Did Jesus? Did the crowd make a mistake in Matthew's gospel? They thought um, they were one Jesus and got the other one? Or I mean, I, there's a little bit of that, right? Like, I think that that's a little bit in there. At least it heightens the tragedy, right? Yeah. Um, so is it, 
I don't know. I think that the there's a lot of people would like to say, well, there's no evidence that anything like this ever occurred. Well, that's true. But there's it seems possible plausible. Yeah. As for the name, I think that, you know, this could be just have it come down um as the name, or who knows? I don't know. I don't know if you know Marx written 40 years after the events take place. If you don't have a name, why not choose a good symbolic one? Right? Yeah, fair enough. Um I don't know if you're familiar with my students in, in my ideas of Jesus class, or in my idea of Jesus class, uh, read Gerd Thiessen's The Shadow of the Galilean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read that like 20 years ago, so I don't remember anything. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a classic. It's a classic. Oh, the yeah. classic. <laughs> um, it's a classic. And uh, in that story, Andreas is, uh, you know, he's a sort of well-to-do Jew from Sepphoris, and his friend is Barabbas. Okay. And he spends the whole story kind of worrying about Barabbas's status before the Roman authority. So he really makes Barabbas into a, a central character. Oh, funky. Right? He's not, um, not, I don't think Thiessen is weighing in on the historicity of Barabbas. Right. But he finds Barabbas a plausible character in the sense that he's, he assumes that he's a proto-zealot or a zealot. I mean, but he doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to be. He could be. Um, this again, I, I'm so tempted to just ask you your opinion on historical matters since you seem willing to say. Well, I don't know if I'm right. I mean, like, the thing no is, I tell my students, like, the historian just works in the world of probabilities. Like, we don't know. We can't go back and time travel, and we don't have, you know, everything that's come down to us has been touched by you know, time and memory and scribes. And yeah, I know that some people are like, oh, but we can dig up and we can find stuff. And it's like, oh, okay, maybe, but what are you going to find that's going well, to really be able to you tell? Know, so, I mean, from a historical person, it's, it's not a guessing game because we, we weigh arguments, right? We right. weigh arguments, but it's still, we're just dealing in probabilities. We can so, do no more. Isn't that what Erman says? We can do no more than establish probabilities. <laughs> You mentioned, totally bought into that. Yeah, that's for sure. The probabilities is is the game. Um, you mentioned that in your sort of review of the trial scenes in four gospels, or in the synoptic gospels, um, that they happen quickly and there's not a lot of interest in the details, uh, yeah. like in Mark of the transcript. What Jesus presumably historically did and wind up crucified by the Romans. Yes, yeah, this, this, this tradition seems secure because so many people say it and because it so doesn't normally, it doesn't clearly fit a good Christian agenda. In fact, because everybody has to go out of their way to explain how Jesus can still be the son of God or the Messiah, even though he was crucified. Right. right? So this seems like a pretty secure tradition. And so what's your thinking? What's your take? Where do you stand in the range of historical reconstructions about what uh, justification the Romans would have had for executing him? Um, well, I think that I don't know that the Romans always needed a justification for crucifixion. Thank you. Um, I think that in the materials that have come down to us from Josephus, who was our only real source for what's going on in Roman Palestine, right, right. In, the, in these areas of Geogaly, um, he shows problem. crucifixions happening willy, not quite willy-nilly, but very frequently, um, without, without trial, without, or at least without any trial of note, right? So I'm not sure that there always needed to be justification. If there wanted justification, I think that the clearest charge would be sedition, right? Because um, if, if Jesus is going around calling himself a king, metaphoric or not, metaphorical or not, uh, calling someone a king, who's not the king, is, is seditious, right? If Jesus is causing trouble in the temple, which is the seat of Roman, a seat of Judean economic power, right? As well as the seat of, you know, Roman, you know, concern, that is in itself probably enough to warrant a charge of sedition mm -hmm. um, because Jesus is interfering with the uh, economic and social uh, engine of the city. But it's also so, possible that there was no charge at all and that he was just caught up in something and oh and yeah that, and then the, that all of the understanding of his of his death uh, 
um, later, and it's this idea of an elaborate trial that gets more elaborate uh, through time in the four gospels is just an attempt to explain something that's otherwise really inexplicable. Well, I mean, it, all of the gospels tell us that Jesus wasn't crucified alone, right? Like there were others who were crucified with him. And we don't know if they had trials or like if their trials were all linked together or what, like they're not even talked about, but we, they're always there, these people that are Jesus is crucified with. So presumably Jesus is part, the crucifixion of Jesus is part of a larger crucifixion, right? It's a part of, a, Jesus is not alone in punishment, therefore he may not have been alone in whatever trial or mechanisms of justice or hap mechanisms of punishment were happening. Um, no one really talks about that, the fact that, like, Jesus is crucified with other people. Um, but that just shows us this is not unique, right? This is not unique. Um, I do this think is clearly some, part of what's going on. I do think that some folks, you know, most recently, perhaps, uh, infamously, Reza Aslan in his mm -hmm. book, Nella, do make it a, a point of discussing the this crucifixion scene of Jesus and the mm -hmm. two um, co these two co-crucified people as uh, link, linking them all to what we would call zealot or zealotic or proto-zealot, like revolutionary activity. Yeah, but we don't know that because, you know, I, crucifixion was not reserved for political, prison, for political prisoners, right? Crucifixion was a punishment that was carried out amongst, for robbers and bandits. Like it wasn't necessarily, you know, politics. I mean, it could be. Right. But, and it's certainly the case that Jesus is not alone in being a political operative or like a, you know, a, uh, a dissident, right? If that's what he was, um, there were certainly other people who are trying to rise up against Roman rule. And we know this ultimately culminates in a war, right? Between the Jews and Rome. Um, yeah. But we, we, we cannot, we cannot say for sure that these anonymous people who are crucified with Jesus are also, or even Barabbas, are political revolutionaries. They might just right? be street. They could just be thieves. Off the street. Thieves off right. the street. Right. Right. They could right. just be thieves who are looking for money or food for their families and have run afoul of Roman law. You know? So I'm going to, I'm not going to guess uh, or put in your mouth what you're going to say to this, but I've I ask you for the, I have my thoughts, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you for the sake of my students and other viewers. Uh, uh, it's a question about the trial before the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. Would it be likely? And if, uh, if it was, is there any chance that uh, the Romans would have crucified Jesus based on some violation of Jewish law? Do you see a trial before the Sanhedrin in the Gospels? Because well, I don't um, think I do. <laughs> not really, right? Like in, I was just looking at John, and there's a couple of chief priests hanging out, and they it's chief priests in a house, right? Like in all the gospels, it seems to be priests in the house. They're at the house of Caiaphas. Like there's no mention, I don't think, of you know the council. I mean, you really don't even see that council doing anything until Acts, right? In Acts, we have the the council in Jerusalem doing stuff with Robin Gamliel being a kind of heroic voice in the beginning of Acts, right? But I don't, I don't think we have a trial before the Sanhedrin in the Gospels. I think we have something else. Just a, uh, the claim is that Jesus is being handed over by the authorities of his time. Is that itself plausible or? I mean, it's not implausible. The idea that the authorities who don't really have any authority, they don't really have any authority, right? They certainly don't have any authority to do capital punishment or anything like that, right. would collude with Rome is very clearly possible, right? The idea that, um, uh, you know, Jewish leaders would collude with Rome, right, to get rid of someone they thought was a problem, or at least to arrest someone they thought was a problem, seems very plausible to me. That seems totally plausible. We know that Jewish leaders are often accused of colluding with Rome, um, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, allowing Roman taxation policies and temple tax policies to maintain, um, you know, the hoi polloi, which is, you know, the masses of people were not Pharisees, they're not chief priests, they're not Sadducees, they're just regular people, right, who are 
victimized by the Roman government and increasingly come to see their leaders as part of a, a collusion against them. And so it's certainly possible that the, you know, there were members of the, you know, sort of Jewish leadership that had a vested interest in um, peaceful, peaceful times and saw this person as a threat to peaceful, peaceful coexistence with Rome. And, um, you know, I, if anything was the instigating incident, incident on that, I think you have to take Jesus's um, activity in the temple, um, where he's overturning the tables of the money changer, money, uh, money changers and driving out the sellers and the buying and things. That's the instigating inc incident. Um, if it's historically plausible, that's the instigating incident. Yeah, um, John, of course, randomly, it's not random, but John has that very early in the gospel yeah. of John, whereas um, uh, all the others have it towards the end as part of the kind of build up towards the crucifixion. Well, that is, that is interesting since if that's the most likely historical if this happened, that seems to be like the instigating. Yeah, if it happened, yeah. Would be the the reason yeah. why Jesus might get caught up or arrested or, or turned over or betrayed. Right. Um, but John chooses to move that so far away from the events of the crucifixion by several years that it no longer bears that, um, that causal relationship. Right. And he might do that. Do you have any thoughts about why he might do that? John's gospel in general paints Jesus as in and out of Jerusalem all the time, right. right? Like Jesus makes multiple trips in and out of Jerusalem in the gospel of John. So it isn't as much about, even though John is a, a text that is filled with Jews, um, it's not like Jesus ever, Jesus doesn't really have a dramatic one time uh, conflict, you know, like climactic conflict with Jewish authorities. He's just always you know, in and out, they know him, he knows them, they come to him. That's not what's happening in John. Uh, so I think that John is is less likely to want to, um, you know, focus on that one incident, almost as if it's like an accident and Jesus could have just not done that and everything would have been fine. I don't think that's the story that John is telling. Right. John wants to tell a, a story about... Um sort of irreconcilable conflict between light and darkness that happens because Jesus is surrounded by people who don't understand it. Right. I mean, the story that John is telling is the story of the incarnate Logos, who was the instrument of creation and then rejected by the very people he created, right? The very world he created. And that's the story of John. So it's less about like Jesus versus Roman authorities or Jesus, you know, so it's like, it's, John's not saying this didn't happen, right? He puts it in there, but it's not, it doesn't play the same narrative thrusting role the way it does. Not a climax at yeah. all, but more of an inauguration, really. That's true. Yeah. So Mira, thank you so much for your bold and <laughs> um, really very knowledgeable, just an almost encyclopedic seems knowledge of no remember i couldn't come up with a single trial scene in the greek novel i know I but that's Geraton. you know there's send me an email in like a half an hour and it says <laughs> well, what you remember i know um but really this has been just such an exciting and a vital conversation about the trial of jesus and in john and the rest of the gospels and in terms of the questions that we have about the history as well as the questions about the literary portrayal of jesus and john so I just thank you so much for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. This was so fun. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. And I look forward to our future conversations. <laughs>